little concerned about the image of the philosopher as Blake uh, or uh, someone who just cites other famous philosophers. Actually, one of my least favorite experiences as a philosopher is sometimes I'll meet someone uh, in a social setting and uh, they'll discover that I'm a philosophy professor and they'll say, well, who, who do you follow? <laughs> and there, there are people who you know do sort of uh, in a way are disciples of various great thinkers, and uh, you know that's fine with me. Uh, but actually, what I always loved about philosophy from the very start was that it seemed to me not to be a follower uh, enterprise, and that the name of the game really was, uh, what do you think, and you know what's your answer to the question. And not in the sense that whatever answer I or you might come up with is the right one, because it's our answer, but it's the answer we've come to, and we could be mistaken, and so we actually have to uh, pay attention to what other people think as well, and maybe uh, justify our beliefs to them, <coughs> so that it's an activity of trying to discover the best answers to uh, important questions. And certainly questions about economic justice and governments versus markets and so on are extremely important questions. And as I'll suggest say, there are deeply philosophical aspects of these questions. Uh, and that these parts of, of the problems that, that our country, certainly in other countries, are facing right now uh, need to be addressed and are often not recognized or uh, ignored or not really treated in a, in a careful way. So uh, what I'd like to do uh, tonight then, I mean, I, I do feel in a certain way burdened by being here. We are in a time of great crisis. Uh, having the chance to talk to you, uh, it, it feels like an opportunity to at least make some contribution, and yet the problems are so massive, and even from the point of view of sort of philosophical thought, uh, I can't keep you as long as it would take. Right? <laughs> uh, I can't keep myself as long as it would take. Uh, but what I'd like to do is to try to uh, illuminate some piece of the problem, make some suggestions about how to uh, think uh, better about these things. I would uh, recommend this excellent book of mine to the <laughs> But I must say, Prentice Hall has always charged much too much money for it. Uh, so I, I won't do that. Maybe you can find a used copy or a library copy. Um, okay, so we all know that we are facing a terrible economic crisis. We are, in the United States, facing a terrible political crisis as well. Uh, and I want to suggest that a big piece of this really is a kind of philosophical crisis. Uh, and that perhaps, I mean, I, I guess I don't want to say that we can't solve any of these things uh, unless we solve the philosophical crisis. But I think that our inability to understand and deal with the philosophical issues is a major impediment. Perhaps if we're lucky, we can make progress without uh, uh, overcoming that one. But I think it makes it harder. So I want to start off saying something, uh, something good about President Obama, actually. Um, and that is, uh, I will say something critical as well, but at any rate, for starters, uh, President Obama, on a number of occasions, has actually drawn attention to the fact that um, there are philosophical aspects of the problems that are facing us. Um, let's see, um, how, do I, how do I move my, um, I didn't get instructions yet. So, um, here we go, thank you, okay. So the philosopher is incompetent with whatever. Uh, okay, so in, in February of 2009, this may have been President Obama's first press conference, I can't remember, but he had a press conference to address the economic crisis uh, and the steps that he was uh, proposing, which were already meeting stiff resistance. And he made a number of references to philosophy uh, in this con press conference. He says, now maybe philosophically, uh, you just don't think that the federal government should be involved, that it's involved in these economic, uh, essentially meltdown problems that we are facing. And he says, I happen to disagree with that. Now, two things.
things about this. One is, uh, again, I'm, I'm happy to see him referring to the fact that there are philosophical differences that maybe are impediments to the adoption of his, uh, his proposals, but I happen to disagree with that. Is not exactly a forceful response. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, here's another quote from the same conference. Some of the criticism I proposal, he said, really are with the basic idea that government should intervene at all in this moment of crisis. You have some people, very sincere, I suspect some insincere ones as well, but anyway, <laughs> some, some people very sincere, who philosophically just think the government has no business interfering in the marketplace. And in fact, there are several who suggested that FDR was wrong to intervene back in the New Deal. They're fighting battles that I thought were resolved a pretty long time ago. Well, apparently not. <laughs> and simply pointing that out, that he thought they were resolved, isn't exactly an answer. Uh, <clears throat> Now, another thing that he did was to uh, cite uh, for support some things that economists have said. So, of course, uh, Obama was promoting this kind of stimulus package at that time when that word had not been a dirty word. Um, most economists, he says, almost unanimously recognize that even if philosophically you're wary of government intervening in the economy, when you have the kind of problem we have right now, Government is an important element of introducing some additional demand into the economy. Uh, well, there again, perhaps government spending would introduce some additional demand into the economy, but if people have philosophical reasons for thinking government oughtn't to do that, then the fact that economists, some, maybe most economists say that some government efforts would introduce additional demand is actually a pretty weak argument. So the good thing about this is that he, from my perspective as a philosopher, and I, I value it whenever anybody suggests philosophy is important, uh, so he's suggesting that there are some important philosophical things going on here, but he actually totally fails to engage with those issues. He never <coughs> suggests, really, that even that the people who have these philosophies are in the wrong, deeply mistaken, misguided. Uh, and yet, unless they are misguided in some fashion, uh, and if, if their philosophical views uh, imply that uh, these proposals of Obama's are no good, bad for the country, shouldn't be adopted, then uh, un unless he meets them and challenges their philosophy, he hasn't really advanced his argument at all. And I, and I think he hasn't actually done that. Uh, you know, I won't get into the Obama psychoanalysis uh, game. That's a very popular game. But in any case, I think it's a serious failure. It, that Obama seems to treat people's philosophical views the way we treat people's religious views. You know, OK, I don't agree with you. I'm not going to mess with that. You're sincere, et cetera. But these are public matters. These aren't private matters. And I think he really uh, should have engaged them. He should put pressure on people to justify their philosophical views, not take them at, at face value. And if he has different philosophical views, then he should be trying to educate the public about his views and why they're superior to those of his opponents. And I don't think he's actually done that. Um, now, it may be that he thinks that, uh, that various kinds of facts or judgments about economic facts by economists and other people are sufficient for promoting his argument, but I think after two plus years we know that that's false. Uh, facts don't carry that much weight uh, apparently anymore, but facts are not actually the only relevant thing here. People's values are really central. Right? So the kind of philosophy that people bring to bear on these issues are deeply tied up with the values that they hold. And again, what we have to do, because people's values can be mistaken as well as on track. And so we have to try to decide both what the right values are and 
and here economists and other social scientists can help us, what are the implications of various policies for uh, achieving those values or promoting those values or what kinds of policies would get in the way of promoting those values. So one of the things I'd say about our own discussion in the United States of, of these issues is that it's severely limited and impoverished. And in fact, we tend to uh, see the big picture debate as one between capitalism and socialism. Okay, so we seem to be faced with this choice between a, a capitalist system with private ownership of property, a market system to produce and distribute things, and a kind of what I call an allocation criteria, sort of rule of the game about who gets what. And the basic rule is to each according to their ability to pay, and then you can throw in, uh, in addition, gifts. And gifts, of course, are, they can be sort of small gifts for holidays and birthdays and such, but they're also very important because gifts uh, may be charitable help for people, uh, and they may also be inheritances, which put some people in a very strong position to compete in the market, while others who don't get that, uh, that particular kind of gift start off at a disadvantage. So that's a very simple view, but at least it's a relatively clear view of what, what might we be talking about when we're talking about a capitalist system. And actually, it turns out there's lots of varieties of capitalist systems, but something like these ideas, I think, are very central. And in our context, uh, the, the opponent, the enemy here, uh, is always seen as socialism. I'll jump ahead for a second. Uh, this is <laughs> something that I found uh, on the web. So Obama has been portrayed uh, by many people as a socialist. That is, he's seen as a critic, somebody attacking the capitalist system, there are these books, uh, Newt Gingrich one wrote one to save, or at least it helps up in his name, to save America, stopping Obama's secular socialist machine. Another one, Revolt, how to defeat Obama and repeal his socialist programs. The Radical in Chief, Barack Obama, the untold story of American socialism. Which is very ironic that virtually no socialists in the United States. The idea of a socialist takeover of the United States at this point is totally laughable and ludicrous, and yet, Obama is tagged, and Obama is the farthest thing from a socialist, really. Uh, he's tagged with this label, which is seen as, understood as being hostile to the United States and its traditions. Right, so capitalism is American, socialism is foreign, and when Obama tries to intervene or proposes interventions in the economy, that is socialism. Of course, this has gone on for He's not the first person to tag this, you know, this way. It's a long, long tradition. But uh, so, just going back, what we seem to be faced with then, in terms of our politics uh, and the philosophies that are available to us, is that either we have to choose capitalism, or we're going to be socialism. Socialism's, you know, dead in the war. It's not going to be chosen. Uh, Bernie Sanders, maybe. I mean, he's the only person, you know who's run for elective office in recent years to, to get elected, uh, but in a small sort of quirky state, if I put it that way, uh, <laughs> as a socialist. Um, but this, you know, in terms of our, our ordinary framing of the topic, this is what we're stuck with. And it's really, it's not good enough. Uh, I mean, there, there are actually, just to mention quickly, there are some serious criticisms of a state socialism as a system, just mentioned quickly. Three, socialism hasn't really worked well as a productive system. Capitalist societies seem to be more productive and make people better off, although we certainly have our problems in capitalist societies. Uh, many people reject socialism because it, it seems to be committed to giving people equal shares and then doesn't recognize that some people may work harder, contribute more, or other people may be lazy, whatever. People don't like that. They see that as unjust or unfair. And also, in socialist systems, governments are extremely powerful. Uh, and some of the governments that call themselves socialists were very repressive regimes. So there are serious worries about having a government that's too powerful. So there are, there are good reasons to worry about socialism. Um, 
But one of the ironies is that there are alternatives, and one of them actually is the kind of society that we have, which is a welfare state. But as I've sort of labeled here, the, the welfare state is invisible. It's, it, it's an invisible option. And I have two quotes here from st uh, students in, I've, I've taught a course on economic justice for many years, and one of the things I often do at the start is to have students uh, fill out a little questionnaire, what is capitalism, what is socialism, what is welfare state, what do you think is good or bad, you know, which you think is best, what's good and bad about them. And then I have them go and do a, a survey of you know, maybe three or four students and get some other opinions. Uh, mainly just to get them thinking about it and get some perspective on other people's views. And the two uh, <coughs> quotes that I have here, I find very instructive. I've thought about especially the second one for a very, very long time because it seemed to capture something really important uh, that even though in our society we have a welfare state and have had one for quite a while, and people even like and approve of and value some aspects of these welfare state institutions, that we don't think of ourselves as a welfare state. We don't know what that means. The word welfare, again, is something that has negative connotations. Um, so uh, it's interesting, this one student, the first quote here, says that when he was asking other people about these systems, he said, oh, the answers about capitalism and socialism were given quickly and were almost identical. There was kind of a convergence. Each of the response had much more, each of the response had much more difficulty expressing their concept of the welfare state, and even expressed it public grasping exactly what a welfare state is. And the second quote, which is really, I think, very powerful, the student said, everyone knew what capitalism is because we live in a capitalist society, but people were unsure what a welfare state is. Now, in fact, we live in a welfare state. It's one that's all, you know, often in battle. But we live in a welfare state that provides people with many benefits beyond what they get by virtue of ability to pay in the marketplace. Uh, and yet, because we have a capitalist ideology, people are actually blind to, don't notice, the things that are in front of their eyes. And one of the reasons why this is especially, this is not a problem for people who are sort of on the right and want to weaken and destroy the welfare state, but for people on the left, it's a serious problem because the ideology that we have is a capitalist market ideology. All of us could recite reasons why market societies are supposed to be successful and good and effective and all this sort of stuff. It's in the air. The reasons for why a welfare state is a valuable kind of institution are not on the tips of people's tongues. As a matter of fact, many of us don't even know what a welfare state is, or my, my students and their reports. So this is really a very interesting phenomenon that you can have in front of you various kinds of facts and situations and activities going on, but you don't have a label for it. And so you don't see it for what it is. But instead, you have a different label, which blinds you to what's going on and makes you think that you actually want something else. right? So that in terms of our political culture and the discourse that we have about these matters, people who are progressives, liberal Democrats, what I don't call uh, uh, such folks, um, uh, are starting at a serious disadvantage because all of the language strengthens other kinds of institutions. And so we see this phenomenon that happens time and again. We're seeing it, you know, a very bad case of it right now, or maybe I should say a severe case or whatever, but uh, of it right now, um, where uh, the ability to articulate arguments uh, is it's damaged on, on the side of people who favor welfare state activities and government intervention uh, to improve society by fiddling with the market in various ways. And the advantage goes to people 
who want a pure market system. So one of the things that I think we, we need really <coughs> is a better articulation for, of the idea of what is a welfare state and why is it a good thing. And why in particular is <coughs> it better, if this is, if this is the right answer, why is it better than a capitalist system? So what do I mean by a welfare state? Uh, well, what, yeah, there's kind of a spectrum of welfare states, but basically what uh, I have in mind is a system where there's primarily private ownership uh, of especially the so-called means of production, though some, uh, some public ownership, uh, in which the, the, there is a market system but in a, of production and distribution, but there's also government production and distribution of some goods and services. And for those, what I would call welfare goods rather than market goods, the role, the allocation principle is to each according to ability to pay, right? So that still is there, it's not socialism, we haven't gotten rid of that. To each according to ability to pay, plus gifts, right? So still got those two, plus, guaranteed access to some resources. Now, even capitalist systems have a version of this. So for example, even so-called minimal state capitalists, so uh, Robert knows is perhaps the most important philosopher uh, who's defended that view in a very clear way uh, in recent years. In, in Nozick's view, the government is supposed to be limited to two functions. It's supposed to protect citizens from force and fraud. So attacks of, of violence against people, the police are supposed to be there to protect us, and also the police and other agencies to protect us from, from fraud. Uh, now, notice that those are not market goods. They are supposed to be distributed to every citizen, uh, irrespective of ability to pay. We might want to actually call them socialized goods, but to each according to their need. Uh, and those goods or those services are financed by taxation. Right? So people, and libertarians don't like taxation because it's a, it's a coercive transfer. It's not a voluntary uh, uh, transfer of resources. You, you don't get invited to pay taxes. You are required, forced, coerced to pay taxes. But nonetheless, uh, except for so-called anarcho-capitalists mm -hmm. who think there shouldn't be a government at all, even the, those people who are defenders of capitalism but uh, defend a very limited version of it are in favor of uh, giving some services to citizens uh, irrespective of ability to pay. And for pretty much everybody, although this doesn't fall under the minimal state view, education is another area where there's a very strong consensus that people should be educated whether or not they can pay tuition for that. So uh, that would be a pretty minimal state if it was just police protection or even just police protection and education. But it would be, it sort of steps toward a welfare state and then the big question is how much should we enrich, if you like, that welfare state part of the uh, equation. Um, so the, the really big question, I would say, uh, that has to do with economic justice is whether the market should be the distribution mechanism for all goods, or should governments distribute some goods to people independently of ability to pay. And uh, as I say, even the libertarian, you know, the libertarian <coughs> capitalists who or defenders of libertarian capitalism who believe in a minimal state don't believe in a pure market system because they believe that we should have police forces and armies and other people to prevent us uh, from being attacked violently or by fraudulent activities. Uh, so in some ways, even they uh, see that the market uh, can't run the whole show. But the real question then is, what, you know, which, which should be doing which jobs? And then I'd say, coming back to this issue about justifying beliefs and arguing about them, how do we tell what are the proper functions of government versus the market? 
what are the criteria for us to use in determining that? And I want to, this is really the, the way my book is organized. So what I tried to do in, in the book was to uh, focus on three central values that I thought actually proponents of socialism, capitalism, and the welfare state, not every one of them, but many of them appeal to these same values, right? So if we could say that there was a, a strong consensus that each of these values was important, and then we could show that one or another of these uh, economic political systems uh, uh, met the bill, sort of met, fit the criteria uh, of these three values, that then we would have a reasonable answer uh, to which is the best system. And likewise, to the extent that other people give different answers, we could press them to ask them, well, are there other values that you appeal to? that you think are actualized by your system, and what about these values? Do you accept them, do you reject them, and if you accept them, why do you think that your view, your favorite system does a better job than, uh, than the others? So the three uh, that I have in mind here are, first I've used this sort of the lingo of uh, economists and utilitarian philosophers. The first aim, uh, or value is maximizing utility or well-being. In other words, one aim of a system, when people say, does, they often say about socialism, for example, well, it's fine in theory, but it doesn't work. Well, what do they mean when they say it doesn't work? Well, it doesn't actually make people well off because it doesn't produce enough stuff or it doesn't, distribute. maybe it distributes it okay, but it doesn't produce enough. So, in fact, people are much better off, so to speak argument goes, in a capitalist society because there's more stuff produced. So you can actually, if you ask about the function of econo an economy, presumably the function of an economy is to produce enough stuff so that people can lead different lives and somehow to have a, a good mechanism for getting that stuff into people's hands. Right? So the aim is a good life in terms of uh, as much well-being as possible. That's the utilitarian philosophers uh, Jeremy Bentham, John Stuart Mill, and others, that's been their, uh, their goal. So uh, we can ask about any particular system, how does it do, uh, with reference to the uh, criterion of maximizing utility or well-being. A second thing that matters to a lot of people, I must say for myself, I'm not as keen on this, but it's an important value for debates, so I include it, uh, is giving people what they deserve. People have very strong feelings about this, that an economic system should provide people what they deserve. And they want to know this about particular systems. Uh, and I'd say it's, it's an argument often given against not only socialism, but the welfare state, that it gives some people something for nothing when they don't deserve it. And that's a very powerful, powerful feeling. So desert's an important value here. I think just on the sort of the question side here, uh, people who use dessert language are often very unclear about what are the criteria, how do you measure dessert, how do you know how much, how deserving individuals are, or, or what particular amount of goods goes along with particular amounts of deservingness, and so on. Um, and also, and I'll talk a little more about this, are there different types of dessert? Is there just one kind of deserving or are there uh, perhaps uh, other kinds as well. The third thing, which I think is important to many, many people, uh, uh, philosophers and ordinary people, is uh, promoting and protecting liberty. Uh, does a, a particular system do justice to its members by protecting and promoting their liberty? I've just been teaching in my class, uh, we started off with Milton Friedman's book, Capitalism and Freedom, so freedom, liberty, a very important value. Libertarians have the word liberty in there. Uh, and they, they promote their view thinking that, uh, that uh, it does the best job. So we want to live in a society, we think a just society is one in which people do have a lot of, of freedom and, and including, say, the, the opportunity to uh, try to uh, better themselves economically, the opportunity to buy and sell things, and so on. Uh, and we wouldn't want those things uh, entirely 
of gone away. So those are the three values. So my, my view then is that uh, what we should do if we want to evaluate and compare different systems is to see how will, well do they do with respect to these different values. If you have some other ones that you want that, that'd be great. You know, we can sort of talk about that and see whether there are more criteria. Uh, one that I ignore here, which uh, Nozick and other people take very seriously, is rights, uh, respective rights. I think that's important, but one of the reasons I didn't include it originally was uh, that uh, I didn't know how to know which rights we had, and people engaged in these debates differ very much about this, and what they, the whole debate is a debate about what do people have a right to. So I didn't put it as a criteria, but it's an important kind of moral language that uh, we use. So here's just very, very briefly uh, a, a kind of comparison of capitalism and a welfare state uh, uh, and my sort of uh, verdicts, if you like, uh, with a brief explanation of why. So contrary to many of the usual arguments, and I'm not going to go through them because I think you know all the arguments about why capitalism makes life better for you know, more people than the rest of the others, so uh, I'll pass on that, but we can talk more about that. Um, but in terms of, of thinking that maybe it doesn't have to be utility, I'd say there are two really powerful arguments. One of them is the tendency toward the concentration of, of wealth and income. Uh, I brought a copy, uh, whoops. Uh, no, maybe I didn't it or lost it. Maybe there's some meaning in this. I was going to flash a, uh, a copy of the Communist Manifesto and Marx and any of these pictures with their bushy beards and so on. Uh, I don't have it. But one of, the, one of the powerful arguments in the first part of the Communist Manifesto is the, their claim that, uh, that there's a dynamic within capitalist society so that you get. Uh, in effect, the rich get richer and the poor get, get poorer. Uh, that's an oversimplification, but there, it's not entirely wrong. Uh, and so one problem about concentration of resources, from the, of economic resources, from the point of view of wanting to maximize utility, is that if you have some people with you know, oodles of stuff, and resources and money and so on, whose needs are more than met, whose desires are more than met, uh, that there are other, and there are other people who have much less and have important needs that are not being met, that from the point of view of maximizing utility, you could create more overall well-being by doing some shifting around of resources. Redistribution is the, again, sometimes dirty word here. But the idea is that let's say $1,000, $10,000 to a millionaire uh, produces less well-being than $10,000 for a poor people, right? Economists call this diminishing marginal utility, right? That the, not every, the value in terms of well-being of each dollar is not identical. The more dollars you have, then you know, the ones that you pile on actually make less and less of a contribution to your well-being. Right? Whereas somebody with less, uh, those same dollars would produce more value. So if you were going to uh, maximize well-being in the United States, let's say, you would fiddle with the income distribution and the wealth distribution. Right? So that, that's an argument. I'm not saying it's decisive, sufficient, whatever. But by that criterion, a welfare state that uh, redistributes, will raise the well-being of less well-off people without significantly harming the better-off people. Uh, and notice that it still allows a market system of production and distribution because it's not, unlike socialism, requiring equality. Right? So there's still going to be inequalities. You don't have to flatten the distribution so everybody has exactly the same amount. You can still leave incentives. But you're going to constrain the disparities somewhat uh, so as to achieve a higher level of well-being than you get by the pure market distribution. Okay, So I want to say that on the maximized utility uh, criterion, 
there's reason to think that a welfare state that redistributes some resources will do a better job than a more pure form of a capitalist economy. On rewarding and dessert, uh, uh, so what I say here is that uh, yes and no, meaning in a capitalist society, uh, there are limited rewards for individual dessert based on things like effort and contribution. Sometimes people who work harder do better financially. Sometimes people who contribute more do better than people who contribute less. But it's very haphazard. It's not systematic. It's not a major uh, engine of the distribution. Uh, so, yeah, a limited yeah, sometimes, whatever. Not enthusiastic, partial yes, let's call it that. But then there are also these, I'd say, strong no's. The first thing that, that this uh, market distribution does is to ignore what I would call human dessert. So I mentioned before there are different types of, suggest there are different types of dessert. So one kind of dessert is earned dessert. You work and you then acquire some kind of claim on certain resources. Uh, but that's not the only kind of dessert that there is. So for example, children, I would say, uh, deserve some resources, though they haven't yet earned them. Right? They haven't done a thing. Right? They're parasites. Uh, but they deserve certain kinds of decent treatment. So there is a, a kind of dessert that we possess simply by virtue of being human. If you think about the concept of human rights, people deserve not to be tortured, for example. Uh, or I, I don't know if I can get quite the wording, but you've probably heard this on, uh, on NPR as well. You know, the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation dedicated to the, the idea that all people deserve the chance for a good life or something like that. Mm -hmm. so, they deserve the chance, right? You don't have to earn something. You don't have to earn that dessert. It's something that comes with you, so to speak. So if we think that there's such a thing as human dessert, then the market doesn't actually reward that. But a welfare state, which gives citizens a right, a legal right, a guarantee to certain resources, is saying that from a kind of human uh, perspective that from the point of view of human dessert, they do have actually a claim on those things. Uh, a final thing about the market is it allows the, what I call the excessive influence of luck on economic well-being. I mentioned the inheritance is already family status, economic climate. I also uh, recommend to you, if you haven't read this book, Malcolm Gladwell, Outliers, uh, the story of success. Uh, I think a very powerful uh, book on the role of luck. Luck isn't the only thing. Effort works here, talent and so on, but the incredible impact of luck on people's well-being and their economic and other forms of success. And it's more, I have to confess, more readable than my book. <laughs> <laughs> Not as good in certain respects, but <laughs> uh, uh, his other book, The Tipping Point, has been on the bestseller list for 350 weeks or something like that. Uh, not mine is but. Uh, uh, anyway, a really powerful and very readable, readable book. Yeah, look. Uh, so what does the welfare state do about, uh, about dessert? Well, like the, since it includes a market economy, then things like effort and contribution can have some role. So the same sort of thing. Yeah, sometimes they play a role. Uh, but unlike a pure market system, it recognizes human unearned dessert by guarantees of some resources, and it limits the impact of luck. And I think that it's sort of true by definition in a certain sense that luck is unearned, right? Luck just happens to you, it just comes. You didn't do anything for it exactly. Uh, so I'd, on the first two of those criteria, then I say the welfare state sort of wins over a capitalist market. Uh, on liberty, the, uh, the sort of libertarian capitalist view, whenever you read these defenders of the capitalist market, they always talk about liberty as, as what philosophers call negative liberty, freedom from interference. So you are at liberty or free to do something if nobody's interfering with you. 
Uh, the thing about negative liberty is, is that having negative liberty does not imply that you can actually do something. So for example, silly example, but uh, I now have the negative liberty to leap tall buildings with a single back. <laughs> but I actually can't do that. I would, if I were making a list of the things that I can do, the things that I'm genuinely at liberty to do, I would not include leaping tall buildings <laughs> in a single back. <laughs> so liberty in this other positive sense is the actual ability <laughs> to do things. And the, uh, the, the libertarian market system doesn't recognize that. It says as long as nobody's interfering with you, you are free. Right? If nobody's taking away your food, you are free to eat. You may not have any food, <laughs> but nobody's interfering. Right, so there's there are these different conceptions of liberty that these different groups different groups have, and I would say, it seems to me, that positive liberty is extremely important and for people's well-being, what we actually can do, and that uh, what we actually can do is not only determined by whether people are interfering with us or not, but by a whole lot of things. And so one of the virtues of the welfare state is that by guaranteeing people certain resources, access to certain resources, it actually increases their positive liberty, their actual ability to do things. Uh, so that's a very, very sort of quick uh, picture of a kind of philosophical justification for a welfare state over a more market-oriented uh, uh, system. I'll just conclude by sketching uh, a, a couple of different kinds of welfare states, just because here again we have kind of a spectrum of welfare states, right? How generous, how limited are there? And a, and a lot of our debates really are about the question of how limited or expansive should our welfare state apparatus be. Uh, so uh, in my book, I talk a little bit about what I call the emergency welfare state. You get sort of parodied in a way so that you have a market system, you have government protection against trolls and fraud, but you also protect people from di other direct threats to their lives. So if, for example, someone was ill and about to die, you would give them the medical treatment to get them to the point where they're not going to die, but then you would send them off and not give them any other preventive treatment. Or if somebody were out in the cold and about to be frozen to death, you'd bring them in, you'd warm them up a bit, and then you'd send them out again. <laughs> right? So this is so the basic, the basic idea here is that we're supposed to take care of ourselves. But in extreme emergencies, the, the state can step in. But then you're back on your own. Okay? So that would be one, one version. A second, I would call the opportunity welfare state, because it adds to these others providing education and other opportunity generating resources. And there are people, you've certainly heard this, who I think uh, Charles Murray in Losing Ground, the attack on the welfare state, had this uh, expression said, he was in favor of millions for opportunity, but not, you know, sort of a penny for outcomes, right? You know, the state's not supposed to determine outcomes, but it can create opportunities. Well, my own view is that this, although it's, you know, equal opportunity and so on are nice phrases and perhaps nice ideals in a way. My own view is that they're impossible. Uh, and in fact, they're not a substitute for equal resources. That in fact, if you really wanted everybody to have equal opportunity, you would have to go the socialist route, more or less, and give everybody equal resources because the opportunities that you have depend on the resources you have. If somebody has more money than I have and they can invest in themselves or in other kinds of things, they have greater opportunities. So there's a kind of, uh, if you like, a sham ideal here that's supposed to counteract the appeal of, of actually guaranteeing outcomes, guaranteeing resources for people, but I don't actually think uh, adds up. Um, in my book, I defend what I call a comprehensive welfare state, and uh, the key thing here is that it guarantees access to resources required for what I call a decent level of well-being. And essentially, that <coughs> the way that I interpret that is that it means the same thing as the abolition of poverty. That poverty is a condition where people 
uh, are not at a decent level of well-being because they lack economic resources. And so if we wanted a serious war or attack or abolition of poverty, we would guarantee people a level who have a floor on the income and other resources so that nobody would fall below this sort of decent level. A lot of questions and things can talk about with that. But that's, again, trying to give you sort of a sketch of a spectrum. There isn't one kind of welfare state, just as there isn't one kind of capitalism. And we can break this down further uh, you know, in other ways. Coming back to a point I started with, one of our problems is that our debates and our thinking about these things are so impoverished. We have this very simple-minded capitalism, socialism, markets, government sort of thing, and there's an almost infinite, or at least a very large, finite array of possible combinations. And I would say the, the trick, the aim should be to come up with the best possible set of combinations that creates the best possible lives for people in a society, maybe to some extent recognize as rewards uh, for dessert, but I don't actually think that's an important, and also really does enhance and expand people's uh, liberty to uh, live their lives uh, in, in a good way. Thank you.